That's one of the weird things about the moon. There's many, 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 many strange things about the moon. And one of them is that it is both 400 times smaller than the sun and 400 times closer than it so that when we have these eclipses, they're exactly the same size in the sky from Earth. That's insane. It is insane. There, there's a lot of insanity about the moon. Uh, if people are interested, I can recommend a book called Who Built the Moon? Who Built the Moon? Uh, Who Built the Moon? Wonderful book. And it, it sort of gets into a lot of the anomalies about the moon. And it's one people don't realize it's, it's like, very unique. We've never, ever, ever observed another sort of planet moon relationship like we have with our moon. And mm. the fact of the matter is life wouldn't exist on this planet without the moon there, uh, without the moon creating intertidal zones. There's right. there's all sorts of anomalies about the moon itself. It's, you know, it's 25% the size of the earth, but about I think four or 5% its mass. So it's vastly lighter and yet stronger at the same time too. There's a really strange yes, dynamic. Yes, stronger? It's stronger, yeah. So it's like it should be deforming at, at, a, at a different rate based on its density and the gravitational pull that's exerted on it by the planet. In fact, there's all these gravitational anomalies on the moon. We've detected like gra different levels of gravity um, in different places on the moon. But what's, what is interesting about the moon is that because there's no atmosphere, we can see the craters that are on it, right? And some of the craters are massive. Like they're like 400 kilometers across. Right. But they only ever go to a certain depth. They only ever go like I think it's a couple of kilometers deep. Like that. it's like we know the the, the mechanics of like crater um, dynamics, right? Yeah. So we can see this on, on the Earth and on other, other planets when stuff hits and it's bigger, it's going to go deeper. On the moon? Everything stops at this one uniform depth, no matter how big the crater is. It's as if it's like this, there's this softer material on top for a couple of kilometers and then it's some hard shell that it just bounces off and it just, nothing penetrates. I think it's like two or three kilometers or something. But there's this really interesting study on the crater depths. No matter the size of the crater, it only ever goes in so deep. Yeah, the, the thing about the moon is insane. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty fucking wild when you start to dig into it. I mean, it gets it pretty really like tinfoil hat, but- it, well. It does, but there's no good explanation for how the moon got there. Like it's very unique. We don't the, the mainstream explanation for how the moon got there is very suspect, and and is admittedly very suspect by the people that even come up with it. Like they're really? like, eh, this is kind of the way we think it kind of come. Yeah, it's the double big whack theory. I think I was explaining to you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's this idea that because the moon is so lightweight and less dense, it's only like it's like surface material from planet Earth is what must what what it's formed of is what they think. So. You know, something splattered into a primordial Earth hard enough, like a protoplanet or something, hit us to take off this huge amount of mass, like, well, volume of mass, not not specifically mass, but only surface mass, like not because the, people don't realize like Earth is iron. Like we, we are we are 40, I think the most abundant element on the planet is iron. It's like 47% iron. Like we are, we are, we are hard rock in space. Like the surface stuff, not so much. There's not that much, not as much iron out here, but obviously the moon's not made of iron. So something hits the earth really hard, takes that much material out into an orbit around the planet. And eventually it, co it, it correlates and, and sort of forms the moon as it is, but that impact into Earth would have left it spinning at a high rate mm -hmm. uh, such that it needed another impact from exactly the right direction and exactly the right speed hitting the Earth at exactly the right point to slow it down to our current rotational speed and, and dynamics. So it's it's what they call the double big whack theory. The double big whack theory. <laughs> yeah, so two big whacks into the Earth is, is how they, they, they approximate, billions of years ago, of course, that, that this somehow happened. Um, and it's not a very strong, like people are like, eh, the probability is super, super low for that possibility to happen. There's, they don't really know. There's, the, most of the people that dig into the moon get to the point where like just scratching the head going, we don't really know how it got here. But if you were to design a system to support life, if you were to create an environment to support life, then it's pretty perfect. Like you, you don't, it doesn't get any more perfect almost. Like we need the moon. We need the Earth in the specific location it is. We need the tilt of the Earth to give mm. us that seasonality. The Moon gives us those intertidal zones with its with its gravity, and and those are the areas on the planet where life first emerged and evolved. Um, it's it's remarkable how necessary the Moon is for life on the planet, and it's almost as if you were designing like a little little test kit for life or a habitat for life. You you, you absolutely need the Moon there, mm. and. And you know, there's yeah, it's this is another analogy on 
an extension of the whole techno- technology discussion. It's like as technology evolves, thing we were talking about space flight and stuff before. You know, imagine now we we go to space, right? We we have to use spaceships and small things and lightweight composite materials because we're trying to overcome forces of gravity and nature. But let's assume that sometime in the distant future we have fundamental control over the forces of nature, gravity. We right. can control gravity. We can control the elements, like the those fundamental forces of nature. What does a spaceship stops to look like a spaceship at some point? And it might start to look like something like a small planet. Like if you can control gravity and the forces of nature to the point where you can create whatever you want, if you were to create a spaceship or an environment to go into space with, it might start to look a lot like a small planet rather or a moon. That's not a moon. Like or a moon like uh than it than it would a spaceship, something that can contain an atmosphere, something that has its own gravity. Like if you that's it's like this pr- projection of technology way into the future. Right. But that's what it starts to look more organic. It swings back around from like these composite materials to organic materials. And maybe that's what things start to look like. So again, in that vastness of space and that the distance of time across billions of years, who's to say that the moon wasn't like like created and flown here and put in place to like support like, hey, this planet's in the right zone. Let's give it the thing that it needs to create right. life and we'll squirt some DNA at it. Right. And then, you know billion years later here we are right i don't know it's 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 you can't again can't rule it out and it's interesting thing to think about and i think with the moon it's almost it almost becomes a more likely scenario than there's than the current scenario of like well there's double big whack it's like thing. we're uh are we is that what you just said is that is it more probable that that's what happened or is it more probable that we are just a flame in a ever never-ending sea of darkness right yeah yeah, I don't think we're that. Yeah. I don't think we're that. I don't think we're there. I'm fairly convinced that that in terms of life, I think we've sort of, although we don't have evidence for it directly, but mathematically I think we've proven that for sure the conditions for life exist in lots of places. Like mm. the Kepler missions pretty much ended that story. Like we figured out that, all right, there's plenty of plenty of planets orbiting, plenty of stars in plenty of habitable zones. Right. That that this the conditions for liquid water, blah, 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 that we need for life, it, it certainly exists in mm. a lot of places. And we, we're almost, we're on the verge of finding signs of life on Mars and this and that. We're like, oh, we maybe we found mm. something. It's like, for damn sure, if you find it on two planets in one solar system, then it's got to be everywhere. Uh, whether it's advanced or not, it's another question. But, you know, again, it's like we are the result of, a, a, a blink of an eye in the span of time that we think the universe has been here. And it may be a lot older than that yet. We don't know. I think there's some questionable evidence behind Big Bang and stuff like this, but um, the cosmic microwave background. But, uh, you know, it's just you, if you go billions of years in either direction, it's like civilizations can rise and fall and go away. I mean, who knows? Right. You know, I just think there's – we're not the only thing that is floating around out here. I'm convinced of it.